they got light back there. Yeah. So we're going to start a two-week series called the Boss Baby, and uh, well, that's a cute name, and it's certainly a cute uh, animated movie to watch. If there was ever a baby that deserved to be called Boss Baby, it was certainly Jesus. Uh, over the next couple weeks, I'm going to challenge you to look at Jesus like you've never seen him before. To think about his birth in a completely different light from what you've always seen it and how you've always seen it. All of you are probably very familiar with a general understanding of the birth story. Where did you don't have to sit over there? I want to. Okay. But you're all very, I mean, it's hard not to be at least familiar with it. But that's the problem. We've become too familiar with it. If you go back and, and, and you, you, you look back in the book of Luke, and you read the birth narrative as if it is the first time that you're ever hearing it, You'll see the story of Jesus' birth as one of the most mind-blowing, mind-boggling <laughs> stories of all time. You'll see the story of Jesus' birth as described in the Bible as just almost completely ludicrous. You see, our familiarity with it has led us to get very comfortable with the story. And we've lost some of the some of the, the awestruckness that comes with looking at it from fresh eyes. You know, Jesus' arrival on earth was such a big deal that major things took place prior to Jesus even being born. Believe it or not, Scripture spends more time describing what takes place in the pregame and the activities leading up to Jesus' birth than it does the actual event itself. Now, to me, that's mind-boggling. That you have the birth of the Savior of the world. And there are so many important things that happened before his birth that the Bible spends more time on those things than the actual birth. The first thing I want you to see when we look at God's Word tonight is that God chooses the bottom of the barrel people to do unfathomable things. And we, you probably never really thought about the two women that I'm going to talk about tonight as being bottom of the barrel. But they pretty much were in that society. You see, as God prepared the world for one of the greatest miracles that it would ever see, he chose to use two people that would have been considered pretty much outcasts and worthless in their society. It's been said that God loves to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. He definitely does that in the birth narrative. You see, he didn't just choose ordinary people. He chose to use people who were literally at the bottom of the barrel. Like, could you find any worse? And it all started with God choosing two women to start the story. Now, this is not a sexist comment. It's nothing about the women in the room. But I want you to understand some things. Choosing women to be the center of the birth narrative was especially outlandish in ancient culture. You see, in ancient biblical court culture, there, there was a dreadfully low view of women. Okay? Women were nearly viewed on the same level as dogs. Okay? So the fact that God chose two women to be where all this starts is pretty, pretty outlandish to start out with. You see, the culture, this is the culture Jesus is born into. Men viewed women, men viewed the primary purpose of a woman to be childbearers. The average age of a woman to be married in that time period was 12 to 13 years old. That's not cute. Women, I'm not excited. I'm supposed to... women were limited to the, to the roles of cleaning, cooking, and having babies. 
<laughs> so God choosing to use two women would have been unbelievable to start with. The story gets even better from there. And we're going to look at the two women that, that start this whole story tonight. The first one we're going to look at is Elizabeth. I want you to understand, and if you want to look all this up, it's in Luke chapter 1. It starts with verse 5 and goes through verse 45. We're not going to take time to read all that tonight. I will be pulling out certain verses as we go along to talk about different things. But the first woman we're going to look at is Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth is an elderly woman who had gone her whole life unable to have children. Now, what did I just say the primary purpose of women were in biblical culture? To have children. Have babies. So you've spent your entire life not being able to have babies. She's around 70 years old. And for most of her life, she's had to accept being viewed by culture as a woman who had not fulfilled her purpose. Just look at verse 36 in chapter 1 in Luke. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren. But she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. The literal translation of the word barren in the Greek is empty. So Elizabeth was described as the empty woman. Oh. Okay. Now would you like to walk around with that label? Yeah. Empty of children. Empty of purpose. Oh, now that's sad. And she spent her whole life with this horrible identity attached to her. She had tried and tried and tried to have children. And her identity had become based off what she couldn't do until God stepped in. God chose Elizabeth to give birth to a baby boy who would be named John. And this John would go on to become John the Baptist, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. John the Baptist changed history as he committed his life to getting people ready for the arrival of and the message of Jesus. But here's a really funny, interesting twist of this whole story. Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah. Zachariah is highly religious. As a matter of fact, I'm not talking just a little bit religious. Zachariah is a priest in the temple. And he has a hard time believing that she could be pregnant. Okay? That's now... True. As a priest, there were certain things that you only got to do rarely in, a, in your lifetime. And on this particular occasion, Zachariah is given a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go into the privileged place called the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice to God. Now, for his position, this was a huge occasion, okay? This is like becoming, this is like moving into the major leagues. I mean, this is a big deal. Zachariah has been given this awesome privilege. And when Zachariah enters the Holy of Holies, to his surprise, he's greeted by an angel named Gabriel. The angel tells him that his elderly wife would give birth to a baby boy. Now here's what's really sad. Zachariah was more astonished with the angel's message than he was with the angel's visit. I want you to hear that. Zachariah was more surprised that the angel was telling him that his 70-year-old barren wife is going to have a baby than he was with the fact that there was an angel standing before him in the Holy of Holies. You see, even Zachariah didn't believe his wife could give birth to a child. Number one, she's 70. Number two, she's been barren her whole life. Why are things going to change now? Interestingly enough, and I, I think this shows a little bit of God's sense of humor. As a result of Zachariah's unbelief, the angel takes away his voice until the baby is born. And he actually utters out that the baby is to be named John. And when he does, he gets his voice back. The Christmas story begins with a 70-year-old lady named Elizabeth, who much of society thought to be useless. 
and then continues on with her cousin and Mary. Let me begin by saying that Mary was not what many of us picture, okay? A lot of times when we picture Mary, we picture this pretty middle-aged American woman who drives a Lincoln Navigator and is the soccer mom, okay? Dad, I think you got it wrong. Yeah. Instead, Mary was approximately a 13-year-old Middle Eastern girl whose virginity was viewed as her greatest ability. Oh, poor girl. Her virginity was her greatest asset because she was at the prime age to fulfill her cultural and perceived purpose as a woman. Remember? Cleaning, cooking, and baby making. Luke 127 even tells us that. Look at verse 27. We looked at, we looked at how Elizabeth was described. Look at what look at what describes Mary. Verse 120, Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 27. To a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Not to a beautiful young lady with great promise in life. Not to a woman who's going places and doing amazing things. What describes her? The fact that she's a virgin. I mean, how would you like for that to be what people know you as? Now, granted, that is kind of it can be a you know a pride thing for for you if you held out till marriage. That's what it should be. But how would you like for people to just say, "Well, look, there's Virgin Reagan, there's Virgin Christie, there's Virgin Kelsey." You know? That's essentially what the Bible, the way Mary was described. Like that's her first name. That when she writes her name in somewhere, she's writing Virgin Mary. Mary was pledged in marriage to Joseph. Now, when you hear the word pledged or engaged, depending on the translation that you're reading, to Joseph, you might picture all these proposal scenes from some of your favorite romantic movies or from these crazy proposal scenes that you find on social media. However, Mary's engagement was anything like that. Her engagement was centered around money and paperwork. Rather than, rather than a ring and flowers, it was all about having the proper paperwork filed and paying the fees that needed to be paid. You see, based on customs of that time, Joseph likely took Mary to a local government representative who signed documents Joseph signed those documents, paid the money that was due, and literally purchased Mary. What? Now, how romantic is that? You had to buy your wife? You would pay a tribute for marrying to her? To the daughter's family. So you had to pay for putting up with their kid, pretty much. Yeah. And, as a young lady, you got no vote in the matter. So if the guy wanted to marry you, you had to marry him. Right. Wait, what? Uh-uh. That's not it funny. Up, it was up to your dad. It was up to your dad, and dad you put enough money in front of him. Hey, up, please. I'm begging. I can just imagine my dad. Legally, legally, Mary belonged to Joseph. He uh -huh. owned her. And Mary had one job during this engagement. To remain faithful to her husband slash master, Joseph. One job. That's where God shows up. Mary is visited by an angel. And she's told that she's going to have a baby. And that that baby is going to be the son of God. And this powerful experience, this, this becomes a powerful experience for Mary. And it becomes a turning point in her life. But you have to understand everything she's faced right now. Everything she's dealing with at this moment. You see, she's legally bound to Joseph. Her job is simple. Remain faithful to Joseph. However, the angel's telling her that she's going to become pregnant. Even though she'd never had sex. And, on top of all of that, 
she's going to have to explain all this to Joseph. Now, Mary knows what she's facing culturally. You see, the penalty for adultery in that day and age was death by stoning. Which basically meant you went and laid on the ground and people threw large rocks on top of you. For fun? Like, people did that for Until fun? Until you died. Like, people just did that. Like, you had to have, you didn't have, to have like a reason. That was like the death penalty. You did not have to have a reason. You could just go kill somebody? Well, no, you had to, you had to be sentenced to be found. No, I mean, like, the people... I mean, like, the people throwing the rocks, like, didn't have to have a reason to want to kill you. They could just kill you because you're getting killed by stones? Yeah, it's like a public yes. execution. In a group of there were people that were specifically chosen to be the ones that would throw the rocks. And they just did that. They didn't see anything wrong with that. That's how they killed people. They wouldn't even wait until the baby was born. So, penalty for adultery was death by stoning. The penalty for perceived adultery was divorce court, which wasn't anything like court at all. It was about making a public mockery of Mary. So Mary is in a no-win situation here. She is pledged to be married to Joseph. She has one job, don't get pregnant, until Joseph makes her pregnant. She finds herself that she's going to be pregnant. And she knows what, the cha what, what happens when, the, when society finds out. Now I will tell you that Joseph shows his character. Because at first, he chooses to quietly divorce Mary. And that's one of the things I love about Joseph. Joseph, I would assume, was probably a, a, a fairly decent godly man. Because he could have just said, I'm done with you. Instead, he was going to try to at least be right by Mary. He was gonna, his goal was to save Mary from at least some of the public shaming that was going to come. However, an angel appears to Joseph and, he help, and helps him believe and the miraculous birth of the Son of God. And after the angel's visit, Joseph chooses to move forward with Mary. He chooses to believe as well. Now here's the thing. God could have chosen any way he wanted for his son to enter the world. He want, God wanted to make it crystal clear that this story wasn't being written by anybody but him. This story is not about Elizabeth or Mary. It's about God choosing to do unfathomable things to people who are willing to trust him. You see, both women responded with faith. Both faced mockery and judgment and persecution from others. However, they chose to trust the author and be part of God's greater story. Look at verse 38. I think Luke, verse 38 is probably one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. And if you're looking for a verse to memorize, this is a great one. Luke 1, 38. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left. Mary knew the personal sacrifice involved. She knew. When she said that verse, she knew what was coming her way. She knew the pushback that she was going to receive for being pregnant while engaged. Nobody's going to believe her. Come on, would you really believe a woman walking around telling you they got pregnant by God? Right, I mean, really. That's what I meant by the story. The birth narrative is so easy to look at and just think there's this great little story, but it, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous if you look at it. And crazy and wild. Yet Mary showed her willingness to trust God and to play her role in his story. And I want to tell you tonight that God wants you to play a role in his greater story too. That he's continuing to write a story and he wants to know that you're ready to play a role in it. Are you willing to trust him as the author? You see, Mary and Elizabeth, they made some big decisions those nights. To trust that God really knew what he was doing. 
You know, I was reading something earlier today that was talking about when God showed up and told Mary that she was going to give birth to the Son of God, she said verse 38 without God giving her a playbook for the next steps. She had no idea what was coming. Elizabeth had no idea what was coming. It wasn't like God said, here, I'm going to give you a five-step plan for what life's going to look like after this. God just shows up and says, look, I've chosen you. And I have a part for you to play. And are you going to have enough faith to really believe that I am God? And that you can trust me? You've been made and saved to live out a greater story than the one the world tries to write for you. Your story is meant to be so much more than I graduated from middle school and high school and went to college and got a job and found an apartment and got a puppy and had 2.3 kids. 2.3? I don't know. But here's the thing. God wants more for you than that. And are you, are you going to trust Him? You see, our story becomes part of God's story when we drop the pen and we allow God to write our story and to use our story to advance His story. So I want you to think about it tonight. Mary and Elizabeth, they were willing to drop the pen and trust God. Are you willing to drop the pen? Will you allow God to write your story? Will you trust the author even if it doesn't include dating the person you'd like to? Or making a sports team? Or getting your desired role in a theater? Or getting the position you really want in band? Or having the family life that you'd prefer? Or experiencing more ideal circumstances in life? Are you willing to trust God the author to write your story as he uses your story to advance his greater story. The arrival of Jesus to earth as the ultimate boss baby was just the just another start just the start of another chapter in God's greater story that brings so much incredible hope and purpose to our story. My question for you tonight is are you ready to be the next part of the story? Are you ready to be like Mary and, and Elizabeth and just drop the pen and say, Okay, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to follow your lead. Let's pray, guys. Father, I thank you so much for tonight, God. I thank you for a chance just to gather here in your presence with one another, worshiping you and fellowshipping with you and with each other. Father, I pray that you help all of us think a lot about this message tonight. That we think about what it really means to drop the pen and trust you as the author of our story. And are we really willing to do that, God, when it doesn't make sense? When it doesn't seem to be what we want in life or seem to be going where we want to be going? Help us to have faith. We love you. 